Right, that's five past the hour, so let's kick it off. Welcome to week seven. Thermodynamics, lecture A. I scribbled a list of things I think I have to do today in the top right hand corner. Is anyone aware of, that says assignment. Is anyone aware of anything else that I need to do? Excellent. Good. Very good. I'm, I'm getting there. Radio. So, today I still feel too loud. So, I'm going to turn me down again. If you have trouble hearing me, uh, wave your arms about or sit more forward. I like that. So, last week's lecture, hopefully you were in the lecture on Wednesday. I thought we had a really great time. Um, Yes. No, I have, an unusual, I have an unusual idea of a good time. What I think, so what, <coughs> what constitutes a good time to me is lots of like wrestling with ideas. Um, wrestling with ideas is also called learning. So that's, you know, I like to see that. Uh, we got through the material uh, about on par with what I thought we'd do. But we certainly didn't get to something that I think needs to be covered. If we're going to talk about entropy, we talk about the concept of entropy, but we should also talk about um, how to calculate it um, in case you've got ideal gases or solids or liquids. So we should go through that. And then we've done the Otto cycle. So we should talk about the diesel and the Joule cycle. And that will finish off our four-stroke internal combustion engine aspect of, of thermodynamics. And we can go on to Brayton, which we might get to today if no one asks any questions. So we might be pushing content today. Um, and that will finish our heat engines using ideal gas. So that's kind of where we're, where we're going. Cool. Uh, the recording from last week. There was a problem with the, uh, the network port. So only about half an hour of it got recorded of the 50 minute lecture. Um, so about 29 minutes got recorded. I think I've put that up. And I will put up last years of me talking about the same thing. And we'll see, you know, don't pick out any inconsistencies. And what I say, it's a complicated topic. Radio. Good. Everyone ready to get going? Quick intro. You're stretching or putting up your hand? Okay. Thumbs up. Good. Let's go. Before we do, um, I was at work on Sunday because, you know, two babies at home. My wife did very commendably. She was amazing. Um, I'm Because I'm studying, I'm doing a graduate certificate in, under university learning and teaching. G cult. Sounds like you're in a cult. Um, and so I sat for eight hours while someone talked about how people learn. I think that's important. I'm teaching people. That sounds important. Uh, so I just want to bring up a couple of things for a few reasons, and we'll get to that. One is metacognition. So it's not something I talk about. I don't think it's something we talk about a lot as en engineers. But I think it's important to think about, and I think it's something I did naturally as a student. Uh, and so I just thought I'd let you know what it is. And you could work out whether you think that's important to you or not as well. So metacognition is your thinking about your learning. So cognition is what you're learning. I say something, you remember it or forget it. Um, <coughs> whatever the case may be, you do a problem solving question. You learn things, right? So that's your cognition. Metacognition is taking a step back and saying, what am I learning? And particularly in light of the course learning outcomes or maybe when you do a um, final exam preparation, whatever, you'll be thinking, ooh, this question is hard. I don't yet know what I need to know for this question, right? And so that's you thinking, not just doing the things that you know, but thinking about what you know. So that's metacognition. Um, I guess, I assume you read the course outline, which is a bad assumption, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> And I assume that you are back referring to the course learning outcomes and saying, what do I know, what don't I know? You're probably not. So maybe after the break, I'll pull that up and just say, where are we up to? Because um, that's what I'm trying to teach to. Preparing for a course. Just so you know, like when I prepare a lecture, and particularly last year when I was preparing it for the first time, lecturing three hours a week, I would spend 12 to 16 hours on course content. And then I would lecture the lecture live to my wife in real time, poor girl. So that was three hours. And then she would correct me and tell me to do it again. So it probably took four hours 
to give her a lecture. So I was probably doing 20 hours a week on this content. Um, to prepare it, what do, I, what do I do in 16 hours? Uh, I was reading two and supplementing with a third textbook. And anything, so anything that's got a, a number on it, entropy change, diesel cycle, dual cycle, right? I typically Google that and pull up a dozen, half a dozen web, web pages, read those through um, to try and learn the content. And I aced this when I did it as an undergraduate, and I've got some industrial experience in some of these areas, but certainly not enough to, um, to just go through the course. So that's, if I know the course content better than you, I've just worked harder. Um, yeah. And I think, I don't know, I think there's something in our society that's like, like motivational speakers. There's a guy who's got no arms and no legs. I forget his name. Doesn't matter. It matters to him. Um, who then gives motivational speeches and like in half an hour, he talks about three decades of life, living like that, and you feel inspired, but you're not going to learn as much as the guy who's actually been through it. So I feel a little bit like that. Like I have crunched this content in my own mind, and then I deliver it really quickly, and you go, if I can just remember what Phil said, I'll have the experience, but I don't think so. I think you've got to wrestle through this stuff on your own. Particularly for me, something I try not to do when I lecture is contradict myself. But when you read a dozen sources of information, you want them to contradict in some ways because it develops the edges of your learning. Like they all say the same thing straight down the line, but it's where they differ or when they do things differently, that's where you get you know, the edges of learning. I'll only teach you one way. I don't think listening to my lectures is enough. So I just thought halfway through the course, let's stop and have a think. Um, you should be using supplementary materials. Uh, there's a couple of textbooks recommended in the course outline. Uh, YouTube is great. But again, you don't watch like one YouTube because it might cover it incompletely or in some ways incorrectly. You've got to watch a bunch of them and then mash the data together. So, uh, oh yeah, this was fascinating as well. Working memory. I'll be going to lecture soon, trust me. Um, you've heard of the idea that you have a memory, short-term memory. You can only remember a certain number of discrete items at a time. That's also true for working. So you can only put a limited number of discrete items in your ma mind at a time and manipulate them. But the next one now, chunking, is the idea that you can build up concepts so you can make something more complex or more complete and it still takes a single memory register, right? So, and that comes down to fluency. The more you do these sorts of problems, for example, the more you think about these sorts of things, the more built up your chunks become, and then you're asked a question and you go, oh, I know, I need to use this or that or whatever. Um, I'm aware that, so something I learned on Sunday that I'm putting into place, hopefully. Uh, I'm aware that I use, for example, words that are introduced in lecture one. So I introduced isobaric, isothermal, isentropic, isenthalpic. You know, I just in introduced all these terms, and since then I use them. If you took the time to remember the definitions of the words, then that only takes one memory register and it brings up everything. Like I'm going to say isobaric process and so today, and it'll imply something about heat, it'll imply something about work. If you paid attention to what I said in week one, that'll make sense. If you didn't, then you have to think isobaric, what does that mean? That's constant pressure. Then you have to think, what are the implications for heat? And it takes up more of your brain. So I think I'll change the way I teach to try and not take up all your working memory using complicated terms, but if you were fluent with the course as it went along, which pre-presumes that you're doing homework and study and um, doing all this investigation, which again is possibly not, um, not a reasonable expectation, but if you were along the journey with me, then you would learn the new material faster. If you haven't been on the journey so far, I might be speaking beyond you, and I'll try not to do that, but it's a little bit your responsibility to also keep up. So anyway, that was me. Um, I hope it wasn't a waste of time on Sunday. Uh, like I said, anyway, my wife was an absolute champion and, and remains so. Cool, so let's, are there any questions about that? I, I thought that was interesting. You are spending four years of your life in formal study on the back of spending 18, you know, well, whatever, 13 years of your life in formal study. You're about a third of the way through your degree. From a metacognition sense, you were a high school student, you're trying to become a graduate engineer, how do you feel? 
You feel about a third of the way there? <laughs> Waste of time. Why? Oh, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's you know you got to step back and say what what are we doing? Um, harder for you because you don't know what a graduate engineer um, does or looks like. It looks like in a not in a physical sense, but in a um, you don't have much experience with that. Cool. Good. Let's talk about content. Ah, human cognition, psychology. Why, why did we come to a thermodynamics lecture for that? So, entropy, we cover the concepts of entropy or some of the concepts of entropy. It's a very complicated thing. We're going to focus on thermal. Um, hopefully, you found last week's lecture interesting. Uh, we derive Gibbs equation, but I want to redisplay it to you. And then the question is if I had a liquid or a solid, and I said, okay, there's a lump of iron at 25 degrees C, let's heat it up to 300 degrees C, okay, what's the change in entropy of that? So that's a solid, liquid the same, knowing only a small amount about the, the solid or liquid, you can calculate change in entropy. Uh, entropy change of an ideal gas is more complicated, but we should cover it too. And then we'll be talking about averages, and I just want to say what happens if you need something more accurate than the averages provide, so there's a method for that, and mechanism for that as well. So that's, and then that'll finish off our discussion about entropy, but not our use of entropy. So we'll continue to use entropy for the remainder of the course. Great. It smells a little bit like smoke, but is that still the Holsworthy fire? That'll make no sense at all to anyone on the recording. Cool. Let's go. Maybe it just smells like smoke down here. So, this smells like cigarette smoke. Yeah. Sunny. Anyway, yes it does. Funny what happens on the weekend too, people smoking on campus. Um, this thing. Radio. So this is an example of the sort of question that you want to answer and it's something analogous to what happens in lab two. You've got a uh, polytropic compression process with a calculated polytropic index N, this one you supplied in the experiment you, um, you calculated it. And what is the entropy change in the air as a result of this process? So when we did the entropy balance work on Wednesday, we said that uh, entropy change involves a couple of things. One is for an open system, you know, the, the flow of air brings some entropy in and the flow of air out takes some entropy out. There's also heat transfer across the boundary and then there's entropy generation. So they were our, our big terms, all right? And so this would be a, well, you know something about the air coming in and something about the air coming out. So that will tell you those figures. And then you would need to me measure thermal transmission, for example, across the casing. Uh, and if you could isolate those things, then you would have a sense for what the generation of entropy is. Um, this would be good discussion, potentially, for your lab report whose spec I will try and get out today. So, we started off with Gibbs equations and we established that TDS equals du plus PdV or to H minus VdP. And those calculations we did last week and they're certainly in the lecture notes if you want to lecture. <clears throat> so using that, let's talk about entropy change of liquids and solids. And it's worth noting that this is a change. So we're not defining absolute entropy, we're defining a change in entropy from one state to another. Um, we don't calculate absolute entropies at, at this stage. So if you had a solid and a liquid and we used our assumptions which are reasonable to say that they don't compress, okay, so then our du, yeah, Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, it's pure in a sense that, so we're dealing with pure substances in the sense that there's no mixing process happening at the same time or no change in the composition. It could be a mixture. It could be a mixture uh, when we're doing this level of calculation. But you wouldn't want it to be a mixture where, for example, one of the substances is evaporating and boiling off and the concentration's changing over time. But it could be a mixture, that's true. Um, so allowing for no change in specific volume, so change in internal energy is the same as change in enthalpy at this point, uh, and so we just get our 
uh, specific heat times by change in temperature, right? Because um, du equals CDT. So we just plug that in, and that is our change in entropy. And now we can integrate both sides of that. So we've shifted that equation to the top of the page. We can integrate both sides of that, and the integral of 1 is just S or X, so it's S2 minus S1. And the integral of, if this is a, if this is a constant, and we take it outside the integral, the integral of 1 on T is just the logarithm of T. And so we get change in entropy is the specific heat constant averaged. And I'll, so as you heat things up, they become slightly harder to heat up. Um, so you take the average point times logarithm of the two temperatures. Okay? So that's true of solids and liquids where they don't change their phase. You don't have anything complicated going on. So knowing only the um, constant specific heat of the substance, you can calculate the change in entropy. So the change in entropy of a incompressible substance only depends on temperature, not pressure. This is different. We'll get to, um, to gases and we'll say why it's different. And if you say you undertake an isentropic process on a solid or a liquid, that must be a constant temperature process. So there's no way to change the temperature of a solid or liquid without changing the entropy. That's not true of a, of a gas, for example. Um, so let's talk about gases then. So this is just the, the next development of the process. So we've got our two Gibbs equations, our two forms of the Gibbs equation. And so, if we divide throughout by T, we find that change in entropy, or a small change in entropy, dS, is du on T plus PdV. So we'll take the first form and work that through to its conclusion, and the second form, the enthalpy form, and work that through to its conclusion as well. <coughs> These notes are up on uh, Moodle as well, but I only got them up half an hour ago. So in the internal energy form, Again, we know something about du, that it's the specific heat at constant volume times the temperature. And because we know from PV equals MRT, and if we take V in a specific form, so we know that PV equals RT, we can make pressure the subject of that equation, and we can substitute RT on V into here, and we can substitute VT, um, CVDT, into the du term, and we get the term down the bottom. So change in entropy is CVDT, okay? And we can see that this looks very similar to what it looked like for our solid, um, our solid and liquid case, plus the R term, the gas constant, times dV on V. So there's something else going on there, and it's related to pressure. It's related to specific volume, which is a, a function of pressure, um, over there on the right. So, how does this look? Well, when we integrate both sides, okay, R is a constant. So R comes out the front of the front of the integral because it's only based on the um, molecular weight of the, the substance, and we're assuming no combustion or um, processes that are changing the substance. So R comes out the front and does indeed become a log term. CV is a function of temperature. It's not like a linear function of temperature. Uh, it's hard to define, but you can see here from table A2 that as the temperature increases for air from 250 to 1,000 Kelvin, the CP value changes from 1.03 to 1.14, right? These are pretty small changes. So we typically take air as being 1.005, so 300K, that's about you know, what we work in. If you go up to, say, 800K, so it's at 500 degrees C, it's only gone up, you know, you've only got an error of, is it just a little bit more or less than 9%? So you can go quite hot and the changes aren't very significant, but uh, you would want to acknowledge that CV is a function of temperature and what we would do in this case is add the numbers and divide them by two, and so, or take an average. And so you say, well, let's just imagine 
that it's at 600 degrees, and we'll take that figure, so the average figure, um, for the process. Like I said, that's, there's a more accurate way to do things, but for now, if we do that, then we just take the average, and we get this equation here. It's in purple, because last year you had to memorize it. Um, yeah, okay, I'll throw them both up. So you can see that it's, it's the C value, log of temperature, same as before, plus the R value, log of the, the ratio of volumes. And if you knew the temperature, so, so, so this is, for example, you know or can calculate the temperature at the beginning of the process and the end of the process, and you know and can calculate the specific volume at the beginning of the process and the end of the process, and you say, what's the change in entropy? You would use this form and this equation. If you knew the temperature and the pressure, you would use the next form of the equation. So that's why we have two, two forms. So in enthalpy terms, we do the same thing. We start with our character, characteristic equation, our uh, Gibbs equation, we've divided by T. We get something similar. The next line down, notice there's a minus this time, and it's also divided by P. Oh, uh, sorry, doesn't start divided by P, but we've made specific volume the subject of this equation, and so we get that form, we integrate, and take the average, and so we get a different equation for the generation of entropy, and so there's the two next to one another. So if you knew temperature and specific volume at the start and end of a process, or could calculate it, you'd use that form. If you knew temperature and pressure at the start and end of the process, or could calculate them, you'd use that form of the um, change in entropy for an ideal gas. When you, had, well, yeah, when you had to remember them, I remembered that there's a V there and a V there, okay, and a P there and a P there. And then the only other difference is there's a plus at the top and a minus at the bottom. So there's V later in the alphabet than P. You could probably get there using some sort of logic like that. Um, and so now we can answer our question. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about more accurate than average and then we'll answer the question. And then if you've got any questions, um, feel free to throw them in. So what if, you know, my dodgy, hey, let's just take the CP value at 600 degrees. Uh, what if that's not good enough? Well, the integral obviously from any two temperatures, from some temperature state one, temperature state two, would need to be calculated every time, but you could calculate the entropy from zero Kelvin to any temperature, and that would have a, a specific value at that temperature for that substance. So you could list those, and indeed they are listed, and then if we define that as S naught, it's just a symbol, then our integral that was difficult to calculate, which is this one here, so we want to calculate this um, accurately, taking into, effect the, taking into account the effect of temperature on CP. Well, that's just these two integrals, which is just S naught two minus S naught one. So if we had tabulated values for S naught of air at different temperatures, right, then we could do that part of uh, calculating change of entropy just by subtracting those numbers. And then our overall S2 minus S1 would be those, because that takes into account the change in temperatures, which is the thing that's hard to do, minus our R values, uh, our R times our log of pressures, and that has an exact value, because R is not a function of temperature, R is a constant, and that would give us a more accurate uh, understanding of the change in entropy. So where are those values? They're on table A3 of the Riesel text. Other thermodynamics textbooks have them as well. And you can see that at given temperatures K, we have different S naught values going down. And they're all to, what's that? Six or seven decimal places, uh, significant figures. Um, and if you had a temperature that was not 
220 or 240, so you had 230K, what would you do? Interpolate the table. Excellent. Right? So it becomes a, a table lookup and interpolation exercise rather than a calculation exercise. Yeah. So, so was that with respect to zero Kelvin there? Yes, it's res with respect to zero Kelvin. So that's the entropy all the way up until that point, or it might be from arbitrary reference. I don't know if it's zero for this table, but it's from some arbitrary reference. Up to that point is that, um, and they've just done it f to every point, and then you can do the integral by taking the negatives. So it's a you know, clever way of doing things. Um, as an exercise to the reader, listener, there's also pressure ratio and volume ratio in this table as well, which again, turn the exercise of calculating. So say you said, you know, something's pressurized from this point to that point. Um, you know that as it gets hot, you know, as it gets compressed, it gets hotter, so the pressure goes up more than you think it would, using the combined gas law, for example. Um, using pressure ratio and volume ratio also provides a way of using tables rather than using calculations to look that up. I should provide that table in the final exam in case anyone wants to use that method. Good? All right. Just thinking. As it is, oh no, because I'm providing formula sheets. Use the formulas. That's fine. There's a couple of different ways to skin the cat. Using pressure ratio and volume ratio is one, one of the ways to do that. Let's not do that. Let's use formulas and I'll provide them. Cool. So now we have a question. Dry atmospheric air is compressed with a known pressure ratio and a known polytropic index. What's the specific entropy change in the air as a result of the process? I've said use the cold air assumption. Cold air assumption tells us a few things. Um, it tells us that K is a constant at 1.4. CP is a constant at. Has anyone just memorized it through use yet? 1.005, I mentioned it a few moments ago. CV, for some reason I find CV harder to memorize is it 718? Excellent. Good. If you need to, you can just remember that R is that and CV is CP minus R. So you can, you can get there. Um, I don't know why it's harder to memorise for me. So, are we likely to know the temperature at the beginning and the end and the specific volume at the beginning and the end, or the temperature at the beginning and the end, and the pressure at the beginning and the end. So which form of the equation are we likely to use? Any thoughts? I think we're going to know the temperature at the beginning and the end, and I think we're going to know pressure, pressure ratio, because we've already been given pressure ratio. I feel like that to calculate the specific volume ratio, we'll take a few more calculations um, that are unnecessary. So I think we'll use that form of the equation, the one with temperature and pressure. Um, what properties do we need? Well, sorry, I listed on the previous page. We need CP, we need an R value, um, and we need a log table. No, wait, we've got that in our calculator. I worked with people who used slide rules when they started as engineers. I don't know, I can't understand them. Um, you may, oh, you might not. They were really old. Uh, so we need the CP value, we need the R value. Uh, we need the K value to calculate the change in uh, temperatures. How do we find T2? I would calculate it. That may be an equation you're, you're becoming familiar with or not. Um, so this is the temperature rise when we increase the pressure of a substance. We're given the N, so we're given the polytropic index N, and so it's just a matter of plugging that in and finding a temperature. And then, and indeed we don't need temperature two because temperature two is just temperature one times something. So if we didn't know what temperature one was, we could just find T2 on T1 here. 
And indeed, we could plug T2 and T1 directly into this equation. So S0 is something. CP average, we've just said use the cold air assumption. So it's 1.005. I think it goes up to 1.009 or something similar around 400K. You know, so it's not a big, big change. And that's just a calculation. So when we talked about uh, solids and liquids, we said that an uh, isentropic process has to be isothermal. If you change the temperature of a solid or liquid, then you must change the entropy. Here we've got a case where a gas has become hotter. 400 and something Kelvin is hotter than 300 Kelvin. Sorry, 413, 414 Kelvin is hotter than 300 Kelvin, but the entropy has been reduced because gas has a lower entropy at a higher pressure. Okay, so we've had an overall decrease in entropy of the, of the substance, even though the temperature has increased. So gases are a bit more complex than liquids and solids. That's the equations, that's how to use them. That's much more what we do with entropy in the subject. So there's conceptual understandings of entropy, uh, and then there's calculations and table lookups is more what we do. We use it as a number to mean things. Cool. Any, that completes the treatment of that. Are there any other thoughts people had? See, Chris, that's what I mean by, by difference in lecture. Like me, I enjoy interaction. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, a clear, um, whatever it is, a clear delivery of complicated information in slides we can refer to later. That's a good lecture. For me, I'm like, I talked for ages. Not a good lecture. That's okay. Cool. Put that in your brain. And we'll go back to cycles. So we'll transition back from talking about entropy and second law um, to thermodynamic cycles. What? I said entropy always has to increase, but here the entropy's gone down. What, what's happened to the entropy? Where is it? Was I lying last week? Probably. But don't pick me off on it. Is everyone, is, or is everyone, like, and that's the problem with numbers, once you've calculated them, you have to know what they mean, right? Is everyone okay with the fact that entropy's gone down? Does anyone want to talk about that? I feel like it should be talked about. Cool. What was our entropy balance formula? And I haven't memorized it, so this will be fun. SGN equals something. I love it. Probably. I feel like it should be. Ah. When I zoom in, I don't know how to zoom out. No, not more zoom in. There we are. Too far out. Right, so I feel like it was S2 minus S1 equals a summation of mass S in minus a summation of mass S out, or E, E for exit. Hmm, plus, no, if you, oh yeah, plus, it'll be an integral of Q on T, plus, Sigma, and since I've got dot notation in place, I should put dots on everything else. I feel like that's a thing. I might have got the in and the out with a minus in front of them, so I might have got that wrong, but that'll come out in the wash. So, so we're talking about this value here, and this value is negative, all right? We're talking about a compressor but it's, no, no, it's steady state, steady flow. Okay, so this is change of entropy in the system. Okay, and if it's steady state, steady flow, that must be zero. Because entropy can't be building up in the system overall, over time. What we've calculated is the entropy exiting the system and the entropy entering the system. Okay, 
And so, and entropy generation must be positive because that's the, that's the thing. That must either be zero or positive. Positive in any real system. Okay. So I propose that the reason that the compressor that you deal with in lab two has a polytropic index of less than 1.4 is because this term is negative. I wish I had a different color than red. Right? So if you have heat Q leaving the system across a boundary, then this would give you a negative term here and that negative term would offset the entropy generation. Because your compressor in your lab is not perfect. Sorry for those who haven't done the lab yet. It's about half the class. The compressor in the lab is not perfect, so it must be generating entropy. I tell you that it is. So you're losing heat from the system and that lets the entropy in the fluid as a property drop overall while you're still generating entropy. If you haven't done the lab yet and you're yet to do the lab and you're really safe about it, because don't burn yourself and tell, you, tell Bruce that Phil said touch the thing, right? If you're really safe about it, you can uh, put your hand close to the actual compressor chamber or some of the pipes leading out from it and it's really hot. And if you feel that it's hot, that means the heat is leaving the device, right? And so that's um, how you can have a reduction in entropy even though entropy overall in the universe is generated. So the entropy in the room is getting, getting larger. Is that okay? I'm glad I paused. It ended up being me talking more, but I guess that's things. Good. No one looks happy about that. Radio. Good, let's talk about another cycle. So this is a two of six diesel cycle. And we'll do the dual cycle, which doesn't count. But uh, it's two of the six big ones. And we'll do the combined cycle, which also doesn't count. This is number two of eight or nine. Um, I want to cover it in a similar way as the auto cycle, hopefully so that you get a sense for, if I can't cover it consistently, then that reduces the amount of working load you have to put on understanding the form of things and you can hopefully do the learning. Uh, it's similar to the auto cycle. Right? So a petrol car and a diesel car are similar, but how are they different? Let's spend a few minutes on this exercise. Yeah, I'll tell you. I, I was. No, you spend the time on the exercise and then I'll tell you the story afterwards. There's a story associated with the exercise, but you talk. So, with a partner, if you're not sitting near someone, you know, buddy up. Uh, discuss three differences between a spark ignition engine and a compression ignition engine. So, in the common vernacular, I'm talking petrol engine and diesel engine, if you're not familiar with those terms. Take five minutes and then we'll, we won't do a share thing. Oh, we will do a share thing because it's fun. Good. Take five. Just so you know, in case it wasn't obvious to you, um, multi-streaming media is a really bad way to learn. Um, when I, I didn't walk around the whole room just then, but when I did this exercise last year, um, I saw four people watching sport games in my lecture. You know, I had laptop open, I assume you're taking notes. Um, <laughs> I had laptop open, and they're watching, uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and one guy, like eventually, like the fourth guy, I, I just tapped him on the shoulder and said, you know, so how's it going? You know, who's winning? Um, and I said, is the game live? And he said, oh no, it's recorded. And he said, but I watch your lectures. I watch the recordings of your lectures as well. Um, you know, and that wasn't available to me when I was going to uni. Uh, we didn't have that sort of thing uh, going on. But it, you, uh, you learn a lot less when you try and multi-track. I would recommend just for the hour you're in the lecture, for two hours you're in the lecture, just do the lecture. Um, yeah, I was working full time when I did my degree. And so I attended lectures and my rule was by the end of the lecture I had to have learned everything because then I was going back to work didn't have time to really study. I did a little bit of that. Um, so I didn't leave the room until I understood everything. So I did nothing except lecture while I was in there. Uh, the, okay, we should chat about this. So uh, not just in a thermodynamic sense, but in any sense, what are some differences between the spark ignition and compression ignition? Can I get someone from the back, my right, your left, right? 
How'd you go? What do you know about engines? Okay, good. This is, we're doing well. No, okay, ready to go. I'll give you a hint. We're, we're talking about the difference between a petrol engine and a diesel engine. Hey, look at that. I saw the guy in grey say it first. I should pick, that'll do. Hey, all right, cool. So, let's say fuel type. Fuel type. All right, back my left, your right. Okay, so it's got to be yes. Hand up. Uh, type of thermodynamic cycle used. Thermodynamic cycle used. I'll pay that. What's the what's the uh, what's the spark ignition engine cycle called? Excellent, good. So I'll say uh, drat. Say uh, cycle type. Goodo. Say middling section left. These kind of guys here, all the way from the camera guys up. Because you can fill in their rest. Anyone here? Not all. Yes, go. Size of the engine. Yes. Ah. Oh. Typically, they're constructed differently. Ah. Oh. oh, there you go. Yes, go. Pressure. I'll pay. I'll pay pressure. Good, good. It's yes. So, I, I normally associate diesel engines as being larger, but they don't have to be. So, let's say pressure, okay, and Chris has been bugging me to let him have a go. Chris? Chris? No, good. Okay, anyone else? Yes, go. Okay, so the, the conjecture is that the spark propagates slowly through the mix, whereas with compression ignition, uh, once you reach a certain pressure temperature, the whole thing can bust at the same time. That's, it's actually the exact opposite of that. Oh, man. But no, but it's, it's great. So the, the speed of ignition is a difference, but it's the other way from what you're thinking. So we should write down speed of ignition. Um, because... That would be true if, like you had engine knock, like we were saying last, when we t covered the, uh, the auto cycle, if you're injecting the air into the gas stream, either using fuel injectors or a carburetor, um, then you would have that combustion happening. But we do something different in diesel engines. We inject the petrol into the cylinder. No, one of the kids asked me what a carburetor was. And <laughs> You still here? I shouldn't have called you a kid. Sorry. I mean, like, uh, cool. Temperature? I'll give temperature. Oh, a little bit. Depends on the materials. I don't think, oh, no, I'm not going to pay temperature. Radio. Good. So, uh, thank you for participating in the. Any, any other thoughts? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you didn't put your hand up. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, so compression ratio. Compression ratio. I should have done this in one note so it's retained, but that's okay. You know, so we, we'll get some ideas. So hopefully you'll learn some more stuff as well. But there are a couple of big ones. That's fine. So we did this exercise in class. Oh, did, was that a hand? Go. Um, if you're saying like the RPM, you're the speed of the engine. Yes. So we've said speed of ignition. We'll just, I'll, I'll put RPM, and we know that's like speed of cycle, so the, the cycle rate um, in the common rack RPM. Which one works faster and slower? Diesel slower? Good, excellent. Yep. I'm, uh, I'm training my one-year-old to distinguish between motorbikes, cars, and trucks. <laughs> Cool, so we should talk about uh, type of ignition. We should talk about other things. That's fine. Yes, so, oh, hand up. Who said that? Because Thermal efficiency, yes. Have you been reading the notes ahead? 
Oh, okay, right here. That's fine. That, oh, that's dreadful. All right. All right, hang on. I'll get another one. Sorry. Okay, good. So, here's, so that's the exercise. Now, here's the story. Um, I ran that exercise for the students uh, last year. And then, so we did it in class, and then I reviewed it, and I posted the notes and so forth. And then I asked a question in the final exam, saying list six differences between the two engines. We gave half a mark for each answer, maybe? A uh, mark for each answer out of 40? No, half a mark. Um, and so many people didn't get it. So many people didn't get it out. Um, it's, it's not in the final exam this year, sorry, if that wasn't clear. Uh, but uh, in the final exam, so there'll be calculation type questions, and there'll also be conceptual type questions. This is a, I consider this to be like a conceptual type question. Like, so having studied the two uh, cycles in series, you might be able to solve a question on either cycle, mathematical, calculation question, but I think it's also important to know conceptually what's different, why it's different, um, how it's different, and so forth. Not just for these, but like in general. So in general as we go through the course. If you want to be an engineer, you should know the difference between uh, various, the things that you use, the devices you use. Uh, so this is an example of a question. So now we're going to do back to content. But if you enjoyed the interactivity, you create that. I only create me talking. You create interactivity if you enjoy that sort of thing. Some people are offended and they're leaving. Um, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yes? So where would you use diesel over petrol? Where would you use a diesel over petrol? Let's. Yeah. And let's cover it again at the end. Because, yeah, know that you use them in different in different cases, just knowing what you know. Uh, so the diesel is mainly used on long distances on cars. Should we use diesel for longer distances on cars? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, typically it, it has. European diesels can get pretty punchy on the accelerator. Um, so some of that's about engine design and not just the fuel you're using. Um, and the other interesting thing is, we talk about compression ignition, there's some companies doing compression ignition using petrol at the moment. So that confuses the whole thing. But I think, let's, yeah, Skyactive, so that's a Mazda product. Who said that? Good, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so it's a, it's a Mazda's. Um, and the reason I want to go to a uh, compression ignition cycle, a diesel cycle, uh, is the thermal efficiencies. Um, so I don't think range is one of them. Um, but there's certainly, if you look traditionally, if you look at the sort of devices that are using the different ones. So trucks, heavy devices, high torque, um, pulling large loads, um, pulling a large load going up a hill. Diesel is, is nice. Um, punch you off the lights, um, you know, responsive, so petrol um, is better. And particularly petrol uh, with fuel ignition, uh, fuel injection um, is a lot better than f petrol with a carburetor, for example. A carburetor uses the air going into a cylinder to draw the petrol in with it. Fuel injection allows the air to go and injects the fuel directly in. So and you control it with an engine management system. Before cars had engine management systems, you had carburetors, right? And they're slower to respond. So you twist the, you know, the handle grip on the motorbike, and it goes, and as it warms up, more air flows, more petrol goes, and it warms up. You twist the pistol, uh, you twist the grip on a um, inject engine, boom, boom. It's like exciting and nice. I've never managed to have an injected motorbike. Um, because I've only had old ones. Let's go through the material. Go. <laughs> we should talk about thermodynamics. Oh, look at that. It's not a bad time to have a break before we get in. Well, you know, before we get into theoretical material. Um, so go, grab yourself a coffee. No, stand and stretch. Uh, let's come back at five minutes past the hour. So six minutes time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>